My name is Max Feinstein and I'm a pediatric anesthesiologist. And in this video, we are going to analyze an intubation scene from The Pit, which is a TV show that is widely regarded to give an accurate portrayal of what medicine actually looks like. Admittedly, I do not watch this show because as much as I love my job, I don't love coming home from the hospital and then watching shows about being in the hospital. But I was intrigued by a post that I saw on Reddit where some people were grumbling about something they saw in this episode. And so I thought, well, at least I could watch this scene and maybe we could talk about what goes on. So it's a pretty short scene. I'll go ahead and play it for you, let you form your own opinion, and then we'll talk about how accurate or not this is. Any suction? We don't have any. Too many secretions, I can't see shit. Here, wipe it out with four by fours. Are you kidding me? You guys have a fiber optical laryngoscope? Nope, just a rigid glad scope do. Except we don't have any room for it, so just pull out one bag for a minute. When did this guy last eat? We never know down here. Let me get in there. Tim crackly pressure if he vomits were Doctor. Oh, so, uh, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh yeah, this is a tough one. Oh uh, yeah, this one. No shit. Prep the neck. Hold on. Okay. Yeah. Come over here. Just give me a chest compression. CPR. Did we lose the pulse? No, no, just give me one good push. Yep. Okay. Give me two. And do it again. Okay. I think I am in. I can check the end title. Uh, yellow. We're good. Ooh, ooh. How did you do that? Bubble innovation. You gave the compression and followed the air bubbles up more than one way to tube a cat. Okay. Well, that was. Interesting. Let's go ahead and break it down piece by piece and we'll talk about what was accurate and not so accurate in this scene. Just for context, you've got an anesthesiologist who's helping intubate in the emergency department because in this scene there was a mass casualty event and they basically needed all hands on deck. Any suction? We don't have any. Too many secretions, I can't see. The anesthesiologist is making a pretty reasonable request asking for suction. Suction is in fact one of the mainstay pieces of equipment for safely intubating patients because that allows us to clear out any sort of secretions or something that might get in the patient's mouth. In the operating room, we typically wouldn't expect to see blood in the patient's mouth, but in the emergency department, that's definitely something that is encountered on a regular basis. So again, this is a reasonable request and the anesthesiologist isn't able to get any suction here because this is a mass casualty event and resources are very limited right now. So I think it's totally understandable that suction might not be available in this situation, whereas ordinarily it would be either in the operating room or the emergency department for intubations. Are you kidding me? You guys have a fiber optical laryngoscope? No, just a rigid glance go there. Okay, so a couple major points and a couple minor points that I take issue with regarding this exchange that just occurred. So right now, our friendly anesthesiologist is attempting to use a direct laryngoscopy blade to intubate the patient, and he's clearly not having success. Because of the challenge that he's having, he's asking for a different device. He asked for a fiber optic laryngoscope, which we'll get to. But I just wanna point out that in the real world, if we're taking a look and we're having a difficult time seeing the vocal cords where we'd like to pass the endotracheal tube, then there are at least a couple of maneuvers that we'll do before we think about changing what type of device that we're doing. Number one, we could reposition the patient by putting a sheet or a small pillow under their head or under their shoulders, or at least having someone take their hand and put it on the patient's neck. This is often called colloquially cricoid pressure, but really what we're trying to do, technically speaking, is just move the larynx, which is where the vocal cords are, so that we can maybe get a different view of the vocal cords. So the anesthesiologist is not trying even basic first line things that would be attempted prior to switching out equipment. The minor point that I take issue with is that he asked for a fiber optic laryngoscope when in reality they're typically called fiber optic bronchoscopes. But if we're gonna get really technical about it, most of the equipment that's used for fiber optic intubation these days is not fiber optic at all. They're just digital cameras on the end of scopes. So it's actually a faux pas to even call it a fiber optic to begin with. We don't need room for it, so just pull out my bag for a minute. What did this guy last eat? We never know down here. 
Okay, so I think this question about the last time that the patient had anything to eat gets into a bigger discussion about some emergency medicine versus anesthesiology thought processes for intubation. Now, in the operating room for elective procedures, which is to say procedures that aren't urgent or emergent and may be rescheduled without causing any harm to the patient, for elective procedures, there are guidelines for how long a patient has to fast meaning a patient can't have eaten any solid meal in the last eight hours, and they can't have had any clear liquids in the last two hours. There's some variation and nuance to these guidelines for fasting, which are called NPO guidelines, but generally speaking, anesthesiologists prefer for patients to be following these guidelines. Now the question is, why do we do that? And the answer is not because it makes intubation more difficult if the patient had something to eat or drink recently. It has the potential to make it more difficult, but the primary issue that we worry about is something called pulmonary aspiration, meaning something comes up from the stomach and then goes into the lungs while we are attempting to intubate the patient. Pulmonary aspiration is a preventable cause of serious harm, including death, that can occur during intubation. So in the operating room, in controlled circumstances with elective surgeries, we make sure that patients are following the fasting guidelines. Now I think that some people have the misconception that the fasting guidelines are enforced by anesthesiologists in order to make intubation easier. That is not the case. Like I said, it might help make the intubation easier, ensuring that there's not anything in the mouth. But most importantly, these guidelines exist to prevent pulmonary aspiration. The emergency medicine physician responds by saying, down here in the emergency department, we never know when patients last ate, which is a totally fair thing to say because it's the emergency department. So it's expected that people were not fasting in anticipation of coming into the emergency department and potentially needing to be intubated or have surgery. So that aspect of it is realistic, but unfortunately what the scene depicts is an idea that anesthesiologists aren't comfortable intubating patients if they haven't been appropriately fasted. Whereas the reality is, it's just a safety concern. Okay, and the anesthesiologist says that we need to apply cricoid pressure and if not, the patient is going to have problems. What he's referring to is the application of pressure on a certain area on the patient's neck in order to prevent pulmonary aspiration. Now, we are already in the middle of an intubation attempt here and no cricoid pressure has been applied. So right now, it's a moot point to be talking about cricoid pressure anyways. What's more is the anesthesiologist here insinuated that there are a lot of secretions and potentially blood in the airway that's obscuring the view and making it difficult to intubate. And so if that's the case, then the patient may have already started to aspirate secretions or blood or whatever's in the mouth. So applying cricoid pressure now isn't going to do anything to prevent aspiration if that already occurred. I just want to point out one thing right here. This is really terrible for ergonomics for intubation and makes the intubation more difficult to have the patient too low. You can see that the emergency medicine doctor is bending over pretty far here, which is actually an occupational hazard for causing low back pain. But more importantly, it just makes it more difficult to intubate if you haven't optimized your conditions. Now I realize we're in the emergency department, this is a mass casualty event, but it would just take a second to ask someone who's standing near the bed to raise the bed a little bit to make it easier to actually see what you're trying to intubate. Just saying. Uh, yeah, this one. No shit. Okay, so he's saying it's a difficult intubation and now you can see we actually do have a little bit of pressure on the neck, but this isn't ordinarily where we would apply pressure. He seems to be applying pressure on the bottom portion of the chin, but really when we're applying pressure, either cricoid pressure or the burp maneuver, which is the back upwards and rightward pressure, uh, which is to try to improve visualization, it goes a little bit lower on the neck. So close, but not quite here. Prep the neck. Hold on, okay? Yeah. 
Okay, now the anesthesiologist is very concerned and has called for prepping the neck. What he's referring to is preparing the neck for a cricothyroidotomy, which is basically putting a hole in the front of the neck in order to pass a breathing tube through the front of the neck in order to ventilate the patient without having to worry about intubating through the mouth. This is clearly a very extreme maneuver. And most importantly, in this situation, it's not indicated. What we just saw a few seconds ago in this video is that whoever is standing next to the patient was actually able to mask ventilate them easily, meaning that they could give oxygen to the patient without any problem. So if you're able to mask ventilate a patient, there is never an indication to perform a cricothyroidotomy. If it's the case that no one is able to intubate the patient, and no one is able to ventilate the patient, so we can't get any oxygen to the patient's lungs, then at the very bottom step of the emergency airway algorithm is performing a front of neck airway. This principle is highlighted in the algorithm for airway management where you can see that you only go to emergency invasive airway after all other attempts to ventilate the patient have failed but that's not what's happening in this scene. So unfortunately, this is not accurate. Don't worry, just give me a chest compression. CPR, aren't you what they're supposed? No, just give me one good push. Yeah. Now this is a really interesting maneuver here where the emergency medicine physician asked for just a single chest compression while he's attempting to intubate the patient. This actually has nothing to do with the patient's heart, but instead has to do with creating some pressure in the lungs to eject air out of the trachea so that if there are a bunch of secretions or blood in the patient's mouth, then you can actually see an air bubble coming out of the trachea, even if you can't see the trachea itself. So this is actually a really great trick for trying to identify where to place the breathing tube if you're having a hard time. So I give them credit for this one. And do it again. I think I am in. Right, check the uh, yellow. How did you do that? Bubble intubation. Bubble intubation. Not a term I've heard before, but it is a concept I'm familiar with. It's not used very often in the operating rooms because bloody airways don't occur very commonly there. But certainly in the emergency department, where there are patients coming in with traumas, I would imagine that this is a maneuver that's used with a little bit more frequency. The compression of all the air bubbles of more than one way to tube a cat. Whew. Love to see it. The last thing that I'll say is that this scene skips over a couple of other strategies that may be used for difficult intubations that I think deserve some mention. Number one is a device that's called a bougie. So this is a semi-rigid but still flexible device that we can place an endotracheal tube on. And if we're taking a look with the laryngoscope, we can actually put the tube over this device and feel the rigid rings of the trachea as this is passing through the trachea. And this allows us to blindly intubate patients. So this is a nice strategy that is often employed in the emergency department that is worth mentioning in the video. Another device that can be used for difficult airways is something called a supraglottic airway or an SGA. Oftentimes this is called a laryngeal mask airway. That's a brand name. That's called an LMA. And basically these devices are just masks that go inside a patient's mouth and sit on top of the opening to the trachea. So these devices allow us to ventilate patients and you can actually intubate patients through these devices as well. The final thought I'll leave you with regarding this scene is the nature of the interaction between the anesthesiologist and the emergency medicine physician. Now, what's implied by this scene is that the emergency medicine physician is an intubation cowboy, whereas the anesthesiologist needs all this equipment and conditions to be just right in order to successfully intubate. And that's plainly not true. It is definitely the case that in the operating room, the circumstances are generally a lot more controlled, and in the emergency department, things can be more wild. But that doesn't necessarily mean that one type of physician is better than the other at intubating. Which brings me to my next point. Generally speaking, in anesthesiology, and I think medicine more broadly, 
If someone is having a hard time accomplishing a task, then it's a good idea to just ask someone else to help with that task. And this happens very commonly in the operating room. For example, if I'm having a difficult time intubating a patient, I will call another anesthesiologist for help just to have another set of hands, another set of eyes, just to have someone do things differently. And in the real world, when the emergency department cannot intubate a patient, they actually call the anesthesiologist, hence the top rated comment that has been left on this Reddit thread. So in conclusion, there were certain aspects of this scene that were inspired by reality, but the technical aspects of the scene and the workflow aspects of the scene just don't correspond with how things actually are in the real world. So this was a nice try by the pit, but missed the mark for me. If you're in healthcare and you agree or disagree with anything that I've said, then I'd be very interested in reading anything you'd wanna write in a comment down below. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you'd like to see a video that I made about how to actually intubate a patient, you can watch that here. Thanks very much for watching. I'll see you next time.